Hey, everybody. I, I even get disappointed when I take RJ off screen. It's like, a, especially that one is a real lesson in the incredible use of uh, chromatics. It just It's just that little hint of stuff. Whoa, Sean Tubbs is here. Everybody is showing up. It's a good day. It's a good day. Uh, today's 5 Watt World uh, Live is brought to you by, well, kind of by you, uh, with the support of the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. I'll talk a little bit about that at the halfway point. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. Today's stream is a follow-up live stream in the wake of the short history I recently put out on Dumble Amps. Uh, today, Baby Ninja is here. There he is. And uh, boy, he snuck in right there at the last minute. <laughs> Had me nervous. Thanks, Bebe. Uh, he's a moderator of the stars and to me. Watch for his answers in the chat. Bebe is a collaborator uh, with me on these things, and I really enjoy working with him. His answers are always on target. Uh, as you know, I always encourage group hang. Say hello to everybody else. I noticed that people are doing that already, um, and I will do the same. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is it, okay, so here's the challenge. I spent a couple of days with Beato and he said, you're, I loved your live stream, recent live stream, but you're so distracted by the, you're such a rookie. I'm like, ah, it's interactive. It's an interactive thing. I'm sorry. It's an interactive thing. I'll do my best to stay on target. I'm going to have, we have a guest, so I will try to be good. Um, uh, so if you want to, if you have a question for me, put a question mark and a space. Um, and then I will be able to see it. I'm going to do the chat from over here in, uh, in the uh, in StreamYard, so I can put up things like greetings from Vermont. Welcome, Vermont. So there, so that's what I'm gonna be able to do. Um, so like I said, talk among yourselves as the old saying goes. Um, remember, if you want me to see it, it's there. The music in the intro, as I said, was a demo by Arjun Ronquillo playing an Amplified Nation steel string singer. Uh, as you could hear at the end of that clip, uh, Amplified Nation, actually the version they built of that amp has a gain stage. And originally, I usually try to have like a one minute intro I had to go a minute and a half. I had to let him, you know, really go to town with that Tyler uh, and the thing. So uh, I feel like I need, today is one of those times when I feel like I'm stretching a little bit. So I feel like I need to run this clip. Now I am not an amp tech, nor an electrical engineer, far from it. I used to joke that, you know those paint by numbers pictures? Yeah, I'm a build like the picture sort of guy. Give me a detailed layout and that's what you'll get back. So the thing that has stuck with me about that D-style build was how different it looked inside. The different locations of some of the parts. Like a strip over by the tube socket holding parts that would usually live on the circuit board with a wire flying over there. It spoke of a level of rethinking, how amps are put together that left me fascinated by the mind that created them. Okay, so that's my disclaimer. And uh, you guys know me. So having done that disclaimer, you know that I know when to bring on a ringer. <laughs> so I got Taylor Cox from Amplified Nation. I talked him into joining us here today. I'll bring him on in a second. Um, of course, you, you guys understand that I've been thinking about doing this video for this short history for really a few years. Um, then when Dumble died, there were so many articles and videos that I thought it really wouldn't have been in good taste to do it right then. So I decided to hang back. I don't really do current events uh, here. So um, better to let something kind of become history so that it would make sense within the, the niche here. Uh, I got a, by the way, I got a really nice note from Drew Berlin on Instagram. If you don't know, Drew Berlin Vintage is a, a shop in uh, Los Angeles area. And uh, Drew is actually handling the Dumble estate. He was friends with Alexander Dumble for over 30 years. And he said that he thought that the video that I'd made, that Alexander would have enjoyed it. And that's good enough for me. Um, then, of course, my friend Tracy Farmer has been bugging me to do this video for years. And Tracy has been incredible. I'm going to give him a shout out right here because he's been incredibly helpful and resourceful. I still have his copy of the Dumble book, um, which is very valuable now. Those things have become very valuable. Um, and I talked in the main video about why I settled on um, using Amplified Nation copies. It wasn't the least of which because RJ is playing them. And Taylor had the good sense to use RJ for all those demos because he certainly really fix, uh, fits how that works. Um, so I, but what I wanted to do is kind of talk about the history of the different models, even after I made a video where I said they basically aren't really models in the same way that like Fender had models that didn't change. Um, but we're going to talk about all those pieces. Um, so I'm going to bring Taylor on now. He's been over in the green room and there he is. And there, Keith, say hi. Me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Um, I was working with Taylor on his lighting earlier. What do you guys think? Does it look good? I think we look good. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I said to Taylor that I was actually going to put him on the spot and ask him 
to talk a little bit about himself because I think it's always really important. I, I really enjoy getting to know people at brands and and frankly, get a sense of sort of the way they think about their work. But I also want to kind of know wh where their playing background is from. So, so Taylor, when did you start playing guitar? I started playing guitar when I was 12. I came from a very musical family. My dad has his doctorate in voice and is a uh, concert pianist. And music was just like so much, um, or, you know, it was just around when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it wasn't really like, are you going to play an instrument? It was like, what instrument are you going to play? You know, uh, so, right. Kind of, uh, you know, school band stuff with the saxophone. I tried the piano and, and none of them really stuck, you know? And hmm. I think I, I kind of got into classic rock at the time, uh, which is always very guitar heavy. And it was also right when grunge had come out. So bands like Nirvana and Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots were becoming big. And man, I just fell in love with the guitar. And I remember going to my parents and saying, hey, you know what? Like, I know we're going to do this music thing, but can I put all this other stuff away and just do this guitar that I found in the basement? <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it's stuck. And, it, and, you know, it's been with me all, my whole life. Um, been an important part of my life uh, since I was since I was 12. Cool. That's great. So um, what's what's your daily driver? What guitar do you reach for every day? All right. So I've been through a whole bunch of different phases. Uh, I was big into the Les Pauls for a while. Um, Right now, and probably for the past few years, I've been really into Telecasters. Okay. And I have a Sir, I think it's just a Model T. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a super flamey neck, but it's like the best amp tester. It, you know, it's it's just like a traditional Telecaster. Um, but man, I think that's the best guitar ever created. <laughs> You're definitely in Tele mode now. <laughs> yeah, I do totally, man. I got a, a bunch of, uh, I got some hollow bodies too that I really like. Nice and light. Okay. Nice. And I imagine you need to keep a lot of guitars around for amp testing. I do. Um, but actually what I found is it, it seems to make sense when you, when you really kind of just like lock in on one guitar hmm. and, uh, that's not forever, but maybe it's for a short period of time, you know, cause I'm testing so many amps during the day. I test everything that goes out. Sure. And, um, so I want kind of the frame of reference to not change. So sure. it makes more sense to me just to have like almost like the same guitar that you're testing. So you, you know what to expect, you know what that variable is. Yeah. So, you, you know, if you're going to grab a strat, then all of a sudden it's like the amp sounds different. Or if you grab a Les Paul, the amp sounds different. So yeah, man, I, I usually just like have a guitar testing guitar. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, amp testing guitar. And that's just like what I use for a few months. So yeah, I'm locked in on that store right now though. That's really smart. That's, I hadn't thought of that, that you want to sort of minimize the variables when it comes to that. So do you have a, my friend Dan Lurie, and I used to go hang out with him on Saturday mornings and I was building amps at the time and he was uh, fixing amps and stuff. And it was a big joke almost that he would take his his standard hit telly actually off the wall it was a, an FMT, a double humbucker telly that he had. It was an import Korean. I think his is a Korean, pretty sure. And he would always play the same thing, exactly the same thing. So do you do that? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> but, it, but it's funny, too, because like now I see there's other guys here that test stuff. There's usually two of us that test every amp. Uh -huh. Everyone has kind of the same amp testing licks. That's, yeah, that's what I'm talking here, about. Here, I can tell, you know, who, who, who's a. Uh, whose licks or whose so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you ask the other guys here i probably play the same thing every day we'll have to get them on next week <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> good that's good uh was there uh you said you kind of came into the guitar at the grunge time was there a favorite a favorite player somebody who like you know at the beginning i don't know man i i think um as far as the players go like it, it was always more of the classic rock guys clafton right. really comes to mind you know i remember just like always being such a huge clafton fan I remember having the 24 nights DVD. It was like my favorite DVD. My brother and I used to watch it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the grunge stuff was always a little different. Like, even though it's guitar heavy, it's not like guitar, like it's, it's not the guys from the seventies, you know, like, right. That was like Jimmy page, you know, he's like a, just a guitarist, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, I mean, so there were so many people from the from the classic rock in the '70s that I just really loved. Stevie Ray Vaughan was another one that I just like could never get enough of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. it's great. Somebody put in the comments that um, that you your mic seems a little low, but I only had it from one person, so maybe just pull it a little closer. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's oh, that's better. Now you got the full radio voice. You got the big booming thing. That's good. <laughs> that's good. All right, so um, that's great. Thanks for that that quick background. I think that really helps people get a sense. Um, yeah, somebody else actually said volume on you, so we got that fixed. Uh, Sean Tubbs jumped in um, to to remind us that 
Dumble was really interested in building amps that were an extension of the player. And we're going to talk about that because that's something that you really emphasized to me. I remember one of the conversations we had and I was kind of telling you the sense of which way I thought I was going to go with the video. And I wanted to get a sense from you of what you thought wasn't talked about enough. And that connection was something that that you said was a big part and the feel of the player and this stuff. So we're going to talk about that. But since we just heard the clip, I don't want to get too far away from RJ's playing the steel string singer. So to talk about like, what do we know about steel string singers? I've heard that there's five of them. I've heard that there's 10 of them that Alexander built. Again, I'm going to reiterate as we go along, I'll say this all through the hour. Um, these were all different for different people, for different players, for different purposes. Um, that the original the original steel string singer was a reaction to Stevie Ray Vaughan playing basically what was a bass amp that got used for lots of different stuff at Jackson Brown Studio, the Dumble Land. Is that right? Yeah. It's your yeah. understanding. Yeah. So talk about steel string singers. What what are they? And um, and then we'll talk as we go about how the different models are different from each other. All right. So so the singer is definitely, you know, they're all a little bit different. I've heard the same things. There's five, there's ten. I don't know how many there are. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone contacted me this week and had information on number 10. So I have to believe that there's probably 10 of them. Well, there you go. Um, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so yeah, they're all a little bit different, right? But there is some similarities with all of these things. So like a lot of times people talk about like the Dumble style mm -hmm. and, and that might say, hey, you know what? There's little intricate differences between these amps, but there's a style to them. They're all kind of similar. So when you look at the Steel String Singer, Traditionally, it's a loud, clean amp. Mm -hmm. It's got high headroom. It's very percussive. Um, you know, it's not an overdriven amp. It's a single channel clean. And they are different. There's some that are more percussive than others. There's some that have more headroom. There's some that are 100 watts. There's some that are 150 watts. Right. You know, I think uh, obviously Stevie and John Mayer are two of the players that kind of have brought that amp to the forefront. Um, you know, I remember I've seen stories about when Stevie wanted his own, I think it's called the King, T King tone console, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, Stevie wanted a high headroom amp. He wanted an amp that he could absolutely crank that wouldn't break up. Mm -hmm. And that's what the steel string singer does. And mm -hmm. even in the clips of mine, where you hear the amp breaking up, most of that actually isn't the amp. It's the FET, the FET input. That okay. is a transistor gain stage that actually just drives the amp harder. So the amp is still pretty clean, mm -hmm. but that FET channel adds the, uh, you know, the breakup. So the, the FET transistor is breaking up? Exactly. You're getting exactly. breakup there before it gets fed to the power section, which is still clean as clean. Yeah, the amp is still very clean. Um, yeah. You know, it makes it a great pedal platform. Yep. Um, it, it's cool, you know. And, and, and the one other thing that is really unique to the singer, which I've always said, is it's almost like it gives you the attributes of an overdriven amp where you have the touch sensitivity, you have like um, things like controlled feedback and a lot of sustain, mm -hmm. but the amp is clean. Hmm. So it's like a high output, low distortion amp, if that makes any sense. I think it does. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's interesting. You know, over the years, people have built pedals and they talk about sort of like a steel string singer pedal. I especially remember when um, Jetter came out. I, I'm a big fan of Jetter's pedals and, um, and, or actually, uh, J rocket, especially when they did the Lenny pedal and they're like, so how do you design something that sounds like it's cooking, but it's in a pedal? Like you, so you're making it sound and he basically was saying, you know, okay, well think of an amp when it's already right up, but not breaking up at all yet, but it's got all that fatness and all that harmonics and stuff. Kind of like you're saying, it's like all the good parts of an amp that's, that's in a harmonic structure, you know, but isn't overdriving yet. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the ones we have will definitely break up, but mm -hmm. you got to get them pretty loud. Yeah. You know, they, we usually put an ear protection on or, you know, you can feel it <laughs> shake the walls or the concrete floors out there. <laughs> They're beasts, right. man. Even the 50 watt. We're going to need that demo. <laughs> <laughs> we can go there after this. <laughs> um, that's great. Uh, let's see. So that's, that's singers. I'm trying to, I don't want to miss questions as we go, but I didn't see any questions about the singer go by. Um, Okay. Anyway, so that's good. Um, so uh, besides singers, before we, you know, move um, to ODSs, um, there are other models and I have some clips, folks. I have some clips, uh, audio clips of other amps here um, that kind of took off from that. Actually, you know what we forgot, but you added a gain channel to your steel string singer. No, it's, it doesn't have a gain channel. It's oh, okay. So 
So what I'm the input when you, that you're hearing. Oh, okay. So when when RJ goes to that gain, it's not a channel. It's that's just that different input. Yep. There's the uh, different input, which is foot switchable, and there's also a preamp boost that cuts the tone stack out. That's also on the foot switch. You oh, okay. Those things, the amp will do some crazy stuff. Sure, sure. Because you're you're boosting the gain that's being pulled away by the tone stack. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we'll and we'll talk about that because I think that's a that's a characteristic that we see on the different amps. Well, let's do it now. So, so explain why that does that because that's something that you see on these amps, and you see them on other people's sort of custom amps, um, where they'll pull the tone stack out. So, why does that do that? Why does it end up sounding like an overdrive circuit? So, essentially, what the tone stack does is it bleeds signal to ground. So, when you turn your bass down, your bass is getting shorted to ground, so it's disappearing. Right, because these are all cut knobs. You're exactly, just like, foot knobs. Exactly. So you got this like big full signal, and then the tone controls kind of take it down in different spots. So when you cut that out, um, and we don't disconnect it completely, it's like partially disconnected. Okay. A full tone stack disconnection is a very big boost. Mm -hmm. So we'll set a partial disconnection and get a moderate boost that you can use for like a solo boost or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it does just that, man. It kicks up the gain a little bit. Uh, how many dB would you guess? Oh, I'm not really sure. Um, enough to notice though, for sure. Okay. All right. So I, I told you which ones we have clips of. What do you want to talk about next? I've got- Why don't we do the bombshell? The bombshell? Okay. I'm going to run this clip. We'll be off on the side here. Then you tell me that of all the, we talked about which demos I was going to use in the thing. And I'm like, so what's your favorite demo? You're like, that one, the bombshell, I would hear in my sleep. That got <laughs> stuck in my head for literally weeks. That was one of the first ones he did for me. Did you request the three? When you work with RJ on something like this, do you did you request the 335 or did you just? No, no RJ does, the, does his thing and he, he does it amazing. I was lucky enough to uh, meet him at NAMM in 2020. And uh, my wife and I got to see, like, he, you know, he's, I think he was playing in the D'Angelico room. And um, we get to chat for a little bit. And I had him demo everything. And uh, yeah, he did, such a, he did such a great job with every single one of the demos, too. Yeah. And they're very different. People will hear how different they are. So they're, they're a very different feel, but they're perfect. So talk yeah. about the SAMP structure. So what, what is the Bombshell Overdrive? What is it? So the Bombshell is basically our version of the Dumble Overdrive Special. Okay. So it's a very simple amp. It's got clean and overdrive. It does have the FET input um, and that's it. It just does those things. And uh, it's just, that's kind of how Dumble made the amps. They're very robust, huge tone. And the bombshell, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different generations and kind of preamp styles from the overdrive special. The bombshell in particular, we modeled after the Robin Ford amp. So that's Robin's number 102, which is the high plate Skyliner Dumble. 
It's um, got a little bit of saturation, compression. It kind of does this chirpy saxophone thing. It's really chewy when you dig into it. Mm -hmm. uh, very fun to play. Um, and, the, and the idea is, is really like, you know, if you want some reverb or some delay, you can throw that in the loop. Uh, you know, some guys like a buffer, some don't need it. And uh, it just does, does its thing. You know, it's a great yeah. amp. Well, I didn't have, I didn't have room, but we have room here. So you said a few things that are buzzwords in the Dumble community that I'm going to let you tease out. So talk about um, high, would you call it high? high plate Skyliner. So talk high plate and low plate. All right. So the, a low plate amp, um, Dumble used low plate resistor values in the seventies and early eighties. And the low plate amps were typically used in fenders. And the reason why is they work better for single coil guitars. So when okay. Fender was selling the Telecasters and the, and the Strats, when they were doing like the black face and the silver face amps, they made them all low plate. So low plate value, is like hundred K. So, so and, and sorry, when you say that the resistor value is low, it's also changing the amount of voltage that's going to the plate of the tube. It does. It changes the voltage. And what that does is it changes the gain structure. That's so right. you might have the same amount of gain, like basically the gain is set by the plate resistor and also the cathode resistor. And you can adjust those. Uh, you can adjust one, you can adjust the other, or you can adjust them together. And basically it moves the uh, structure of the gain. So the low plate tends to work better with the strats and then Dumble moved to a high plate amp, which is more like 220 K or 150 K. And then even though you might have the same amount of gain, it's uh, it's like almost like more nasally huh. and does um, more of a smooth thing. So like the low plate amps can be a little throatier um, and really kind of fatter mids and work great for the uh, strats and the telecasters. And then when you get to the high plate amps, um, they're real smooth and they're like a little bit compressed and they get that kind of chirpy Robin Ford thing that you hear with humbuckers. A little bit more compressed than the low plate? Yeah. Yeah. So, so less compression than the low plate. Okay. So a little, yeah. Okay. So, and then when you say like a saxophone, then that, I think of that as a more compressed kind of sound. Yeah. Like a honky thing. Yeah. And, and also that you um, are describing something that feels easier to play. Most of us are, are happier that the compression is hiding some of our sloppiness in our playing. So a high, a higher plate amp would be good for that. Yeah. 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 Which is why so many of our guitar heroes play single coil guitars. So yep. So the, yeah, the, the bombshells, the high plate Skyliner, obviously we can do different preamps in it, um, yeah. but we really love that one and kind of have locked in on it with the bombshell. Okay. Let's, well, let's do, tell me what a Skyliner is, and then we'll come back to, we can do different preamps in it. Um, so the Skyliner is the tone stack and there's a Skyliner and there's a classic tone stack. Okay. And when did they use each one? When did he use um, each one? The low plate amps were more of the classic. Mm-hmm. And then the high plates are more of the Skyliners. Okay. So you can have a low plate Skyliner and you have a, <laughs> like a high plate classic, but I don't think there's too many of them. Okay. And then, so what's the difference in like values? Just let's nerd out here. Um, so like I said, the low plates, a hundred K. That's the, that's the plate resistor, but like. Resistor and one K five for the cathode. Okay. And then the high plate Skyliners have a 220 on one side for the plate, 220 and 150 on the other side. Okay. And then the cathode resistors are 2.2K and 3.3K. And then how's the tone stack different? Uh, the tone stack, the low plate classic or the classic tone stack has like a real fat mid cap. So you'll hear kind of more mids. Um, the Skyliner maybe has a little bit more of a rock, uh, less mids, but... A little more scooped? Yeah, maybe maybe slightly scooped. Okay. Okay, cool. That's great. That's really helpful. I this is not something I got to learn during the research. And so I'm pretty sure that the folks who watch the video, although there's always people in the chat that know more than me about that stuff. So, um, so the details, well, exactly. Like I don't, I don't build these things. So I, I built, I built one, but I, I couldn't even begin to tell you like which, which generation that ODS, you know, that I was pulling together. Yeah, they really, the honestly, it's subtle differences. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. Yeah, and just and saying it that way doesn't mean that you can't play a low plate classic with um, a humbucking guitar. It doesn't they're not these are not there's no hard and fast. No. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk briefly because I think it's right in the spirit of what Dumble did his whole life uh, in, in his building. You said, but we can do different preamps. 
in any of the amps. So you could build somebody a bombshell with what variety of preamps? Uh, the seventies preamp. Yeah. We could do the eighties, which is kind of the, that low plate classic I was talking about. Or mm -hmm. uh, we could do the high plate Skyliner. Hmm. So all the different ones. And that would vary depending on a conversation you had with the player about what? You know, what happens usually is someone will watch a whole bunch of demo videos mm -hmm. and they'll want, for example, the tone of the bombshell. So they'll want that high plate Skyliner, but they'll right. want reverb. Oh, okay. And so they'll like the features of another amp, but the tones of an amp that maybe doesn't have those features. So sometimes we'll build like the bombshell preamp into the overdrive reverb or the Wonderland overdrive. Huh. So you'll have a Wonderland overdrive that looks like a Wonderland overdrive, but it's got a high plate Skyliner preamp into it. So it's really all stirred together. It's a bombshell overdrive with reverb. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do a lot of customizations like that. Yeah. Uh, we, we tend to not do too much circuit stuff. Uh, but if it's something like that, you know, it's it's pretty run of the mill. Yeah. I told Taylor before we got started that the first half hour blows past and right on schedule, it, the first half hour is already gone. So let me do my uh, let me do my ad for Patreon and then I'll bring Taylor back and we will talk more of the specific kinds of things, especially the ultrafonic stuff and the things that can happen there. So let me do that. Uh, as everybody has heard me say before, today's five watt live is brought to you by the friends of five watt my support community on Patreon. Uh, there's three levels of membership, five, 10 and $50 a month. You probably realize that I read all the comments. I, I always chuckle when people say, I want to thank the whole team there. There are lots of people I work with on these things between Jeff and Perry and Bebe. I really think of everybody as part of it. But when it comes to reading the comments and reading the email, that's me. Um, I, I, I joke that I look over my shoulder in this small bedroom where I do most of the work. Um, uh, you know that I spent a few months thinking about what I was going to call the channel. And it was funny. I did a meetup. I almost loaded some pictures. We'd had a meetup in New York City because I was down there for Rick's last show. And uh, I got to hang out with 25 or 30 members of 5 Watt World. And it was amazing. It was so much fun. Um, and the reality was I, I did that because I wanted to talk about what a community is. And I had heard actually a lot of stuff about Patreon talking about how... Um, it's not a community if they can't talk to each other and you guys are here in the chat and i really try to interact with the chat but at the same time it's just not the same thing as people being in the same room together um and so i the real idea actually it was great i had some guy walk right up to me and he goes so why'd you do this and i said because it's a world and i wanted you to be able to meet each other and actually people did immediately realize it was funny that guy actually had been friends with other people that were there that he didn't had no idea that they were going to be there and they hadn't seen each other in like six years. And then there were other musicians who's like an upright bass player, Chris, who met a guy who's a, a you know, a jazz guitarist in the city. And everybody, <laughs> I can tell you, every guitar player I know wants to know an upright player if they play anything remotely like jazz, that is gold to have that. So those connections are really what Five Watt World is about. And that's really what Patreon um, has let me do is build a place where people get really easy access to me. And, um, and it's really good because the numbers are, are even smaller. You know, I, I get uh, I get a lot of comments. I read all the comments, as I said. So um, and I get about five hundred and fifty thousand views a month. So the channel is still that might not sound manageable, but it is almost still manageable uh, size. Um, so um, so that's what that is. So if you if you can afford it and you think about becoming a friend of five watt on Patreon and when you enroll, send me a message so we can start a conversation. And I always enjoy that. So let's bring Taylor back and get back to work. There we go. All right. Uh, everybody's is funny. I'll, uh, I'm going to, since we're at the half point, let me do some notifications here. RJ popped in while you were off. Well, you were here, but anyway, RJ, RJ arrived. Um, and it's great. Uh, and everybody's saying hi to RJ, the celebrity that he should be because of his playing is a monster. Um, a lot. And you actually seem, and I'm, I've been watching in the chat. There's a lot of, um, there was a lot of love for the brand here. Not surprising knowing that you were going to be here today, that you got a lot of people who are actually playing your amps already. Um, so uh, love it. And and Mike Kretz, who's been a long time uh, Patreon guy. Uh, where, oh, he's a customer. Yeah. yeah. I remember Mike. Yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike and I have known each other uh, through here for a long time. He's a very busy guy, but he's, he's great. He finds time. I actually sold Mike my R9. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. There's a nice light guitar. And then he traded it for an even lighter uh, Chicago music exchange guitar. Um, so we had a live 
stream question earlier, and I'm going to go back there. We had a top chat. Joshua Koyukuk says, what's a crystal lattice and what's it have to do with amps? No, the crystal lattice, I, I believe, is uh, something to do with electrons floating around inside the tube. So the way uh, I'm sure his question may have been sarcastic. OK, because of some of the old videos that are out there, but um, it's a thing. There's really a crystal lattice. It's inside a tube. When a tube amplifies something, essentially what happens is electrons run, rush through it. And the the speed of those electrons going through it are what set the level of amplification. So I'm not sure exactly what the crystal lattice is, but I believe it's something to do with that vacuum uh, movement of electrons. And if you do it in a certain way, you get good results. Interesting. Great. Uh, Jason Carter, a longtime fan of the channel here, says, I'm not at all technical as for amps are concerned, but it's fascinating to listen to. I, I find the same way. I don't understand the uh, technology, the engineering of it, but I'm fascinated to know these little details um, about how these things work. Uh, Murray Williams wants to know, do you have to turn a steel string singer amp all the way up to the moon to get it to sound good? Definitely not. Definitely not. No. <clears throat> It'll sound good low volume. I get a lot of customers that play these things at home. Yeah, you know, guys that aren't gigging, and uh, yeah, singer singer does great stuff. I mean, it, you're not going to get it to do crazy amounts of breakup at at bedroom levels, um, but uh, you don't have to crank it to the moon. Now, this is a great place actually to insert one of the things that you do that actually I didn't realize, but um, Dumble built a six v six twenty two watt uh, ODS for Larry Carlton at one point to use in the studio. I don't know how much he ended up using in the studio, but I didn't know that Dumbo built any amps. I, I'd heard that he um, had redone people's 5e3, you know, tweed, tweed deluxes and stuff like that. But you actually offer a number of these models. And you know what? I have the slide, so let me throw it up on the screen. Um, you have a, a large number of models here. We're going to talk about a few of them as we go through. But um, you offer... Which of these do you offer as a 22 watt model? Which is the one I have here. I have a Wonderland Overdrive that's 22 watt, which is actually switchable down to 10 watts. So yeah, so we've always been a custom company. Um, you know, I used to build by myself. I would talk to customers one on one. I would go build their amp, and I allow I would I allow so many different customizations. Everything, anything from power level to aesthetics, and uh, <clears throat> I've just decided to keep all those. So mm -hmm. even though we're a bigger company now, we've got more guys here building. I tried to retain a lot of those custom options. So you can actually go on the site and order any of our amps in all the power levels. Oh, really? So you can get 22, 50 watts, or 100 watts in every single amp. Uh, the singer comes in 150 watts if you really want to get crazy. And then, and then also, in addition to that, you can choose head, you can choose combo, um, you can choose what you want the amp to look like, anything from you know a whole bunch of Tolexes to, to suede's. We've got like a whole bunch of cloths. And then we still do custom stuff. I mean, the, you know, you've probably seen some stuff on Instagram lately. Like we've done uh, some baffles that are really crazy. So, you know, we, we, we tend to mostly do the traditional stuff, the oxblood gold stripe, the black roll cloth. Um, but uh, we've been doing some fun stuff lately. So to answer your question in a long way, all the amps are 22 watts. We still have all the customization options that I had when I started the business. And uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we really try to kind of tailor the amp to every single person. So they get a custom shop experience every single time they buy from us. Oh, that's great. So you said they're all 22. What you meant was they're all available as 22. They're all available in 22. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So um, what percentage of the amps get ordered at each of the levels? I'd have to grab the slides. I would say we just did the math on it. I think about 60% of amps go out as 50 watts. Okay. And then 122 are just about split at 20%. Okay. And then there's a few 150s. We've probably done like five or six 150s this year. Oh, this year? Yeah. Yeah, we don't do that many of those. They're, they're intimidating to say the least. And then and then if somebody was looking to use uh, this style amp, like a singer, like, like a Wonderland again, as a bass amp, is that where you'd point them into the big wattage? If they wanted to use the, a, an amp as a bass amp? One of your amps as a bass amp or something that yeah. would kind of do both. We've used the Dirty Wonderland a couple times, like a 100 watt Dirty Wonderland. There's a couple of those in some studios. Um, they work pretty well. Yeah, you need a lot of lot of, uh, a lot of of power and then a different cabinet, obviously. You can't run it through a guitar speaker. Yeah, right, right, of course, yeah. All right, let's do, uh, let's do the next amp. Let's talk about, um, 
that Christopher Vincent says, could you do a five water? And uh, how about that? And I think he's just joking around because that joke. Like, yeah, that's a bad. That, so that is, we, should, we should go on to the, the Wonderland Overdrive. Yeah. Kind of, when, when you take that, um, the bombshell is the first one we talked about, yep. Overdrive special style. I had so many customers that were looking for more features. So just being an Overdrive special, there's really just like, a, there's not a lot to fiddle with. There's no onboard reverb. There's not features like half power. Um, so the Wonderland Overdrive is kind of that ODS platform with some additional features. So it has reverb built in. That is more of the low plate classic that okay. really shines with the single coil stuff. You can play a strat through that and it's absolutely amazing. It's definitely one of the better dumbbell style amps for strats mm -hmm. that, uh, that's out there. Okay, let me run that clip. Okay, let's talk about this. There were a lot of comments in the side to trying to explain what this amp is. People wanting to know if this is a Mayer reference with the Wonderland. Um, Mike thought that uh, he put Wonderland equals Dumbleland. Talk about the it's talk about the ground channel. It is a Mayer reference. Okay, so Mayer plays a two rock amp. He's played it for years. I believe he's been touring with it lately. I definitely saw it on stage with him last March. Um, it was a signature model that he came out with in two thousand seven. And um, just has a great, great clean tone. Mm -hmm. And that is based off of the low plate classic. Oh, okay. So that's what we did. Had that same um, low plate classic clean channel. The Wonderland is definitely the mayor reference. Originally, when we came out with that, that sound was the Dirty Wonderland, which is another amp in the lineup. Mm -hmm. And that amp is a single channel clean. So that's just the clean channel of the ODS with oh, a beautiful okay. reverb built in. So uh, three tube. Um, send and return controls. You can set the depth of the reverb. It's an enormous effect. Mm. Absolutely mind blowing. One of the best clean amps you can you can play. I had so many guys that love that amp, but wanted to have an overdrive channel. So mm. then we kind of made that. Uh, we kind of built back the rest of the low plate classic and put the overdrive channel onto it. So the Wonderland Overdrive and the Dirty Wonderland do share the same clean channel. Um, the Wonderland Overdrive has the second channel and a different reverb circuit. And the Dirty Wonderland has just the clean channel and the big reverb circuit. So what's dirty about the Dirty Wonderland? It has a couple switches in the back um, that don't particularly give the amp an overdrive sound, mm -hmm. but they're called dirty switches. And there's one for the power amp and there's one for the preamp. So you can dirty up the preamp or you can dirty up the power amp or you can use them together and really kind of dirty up the amp. And it's great for low volume playing. Like if you're playing at home and you just want to have like a little bit of hair on the notes, yeah, yeah. You, you really turn it up, which is, a, you know, everyone loves that. Sure. Um, those dirty switches can be great. Fascinating.
because because everything you were describing was about this this wonderful clean amp with lots of control of the reverb and all this kind of stuff. I'm I'm nodding my head yes, and I'm going wait a minute, well, how's the name work? So I, actually, RJ does in people should go watch it if they want to get a better sense of what that is. RJ does flip the switches and lets you know that that's what's happening in the amp. Yeah, I, I think in hindsight, I may have named those amps a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go back to the amp page. There we go. <laughs> Because it does confuse people. So yeah, the Dirty Wonderland, the Wonderland Overdrive. Um, we talked about the bombshell. The Overdrive Reverb has been an absolutely fantastic amp for us. We came out with it in 2020 after a couple of years of research. And that is modeled kind of after a Dumble Overdrive Reverb, um, which uh, people like Santana have played, Bonnie Raitt, Lowell George. And it, it does the Dumble ODS stuff. Again, low plate classic in that amp. But... The amp is filled with features. It's got two ratio controls in the back that allow you to set the master volumes of each channel, mm -hmm. which are really great for, for dialing in low volume stuff and just giving you kind of more flexibility and more control yeah. over the gain staging. Um, but the, the, the reverb in that amp in particular is that same um, three tube, two knob control reverb. Mm -hmm. So you get kind of like when we we're talking about the dirty wonderland of the wonderland overdrive you get all that stuff so you get the great clean the great overdrive and the huge reverb um, and it's a bigger amp right i mean because you have two different size heads amp. it's phil it's got six preamp tubes also wow. i know it's a lot so um it has kind of like a wet dry mixing stage too so like the reverb and the dry signal come together yeah through all that signal processing and all those gain changes the amp gets this like really amazing brilliance and it just sounds so good you can't get a bad tone out of it it can be a little cumbersome to set up because it has so many controls. But once sure. you get it dialed in, it's absolutely amazing. This is all the over, all that stuff you're talking about is the overdrive reverb. It's got all of these controls. Yep. Yeah. Just, you know, the ratio controls in the back are essentially it has four volume controls. Right. And then so, also a master volume. So it's a little intimidating, but again, it's not that difficult. Right. So I think you transitioned us from the bombshell, um, no, the dirty wonderland to the overdrive reverb. The bombshell overdrive right to the yep and then we went to dirty wonderland and then overdrive reverb and it, that's sort of the the direction that this all went right so there's yeah so you got two more amps in the and actually we're good we're doing really a good job with the time there's two more amps in your lineup and i'm fascinated by two things about the way you you run the company let me get back to us um one is and I said this in the video and honestly, I, I'll be really blunt about it. If this wasn't true, I wouldn't probably be sitting here with you. I love the fact that you are um, paying homage to this, to this line. And I said it in the video, like every amp designer before you, you're building on the past. That's what everyone does. Um, you're not building clones is my point. And you're, you're responding to the marketplace just like Leo did at the beginning. You're talking to, to players all the time. You're talking to guitarists all the time. So th these amp models and the changes, you've talked about it just continuously here, are all things in reaction to the marketplace. People are saying, players, guitarists are saying to you, yeah, I really wanted to do this, but I also wanted to do this other thing, which wasn't something that existed before. Yeah, so when this all started, and, and when, I definitely, when I got into this around 2011, um, with, with really kind of building my own circuits and stuff, or 2010, I can't remember, the biggest thing back then and the biggest thing I was trying to do was was clone stuff. And it was like, how, can you get your amp as close to this Dumble as possible? Right. And you go online and you would search for new old stock components and try to find, you know, MEPCO resistors or Pyre resistors. You'd be spending four dollars on a capacitor or whatever. You know, what I mean, trying to like recreate a 70s Dumble, like let's use all the exact parts, find the vintage iron, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, that was fun. But that you can't like you can build a great amp that way, but you can't scale it. Right. You know, like you can't go and, and sell yeah. NOS parts and all this old glass and stuff. Um, so I kind of took it in a different direction. I said, you know what, let's keep the amps in this style, but let's take the best things that I've seen through my experience, the best features, the best sounds from these amps, the things that would appeal to the most amount of people in a way where they can really connect with the instrument mm -hmm. in a way that they can feel confident that they sound their best when they're playing it, you know, out at a gig mm -hmm. and, um, and really be an extension of the guitar, you know, where it was less about playing the guitar and more about playing the amp, you know, and having the guitar almost be like a remote control for that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So yeah, I took it in a different direction and, and really 
um, what I found was that instead of trying to recreate something that someone else had done, putting my own spin on it actually made more people like it. And, mm -hmm. and it, and it resonated more with the, the, you know, my customers and, and I got more people that were so happy to have a new amp and that became more of my passion where it was less about cloning and mm -hmm. more about like, how do I get these people to absolutely love playing guitar even more? You know, like how do I change guitar for people where they come from a hot rod DeVille or a, you know, a, a more basic amp that they got a guitar center and they move up to the boutique level and they're like, Oh my God, I can't believe how I feel playing this. The connection that I get, you know, where the amp is actually doing things that I want it to, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like I'm playing the guitar and it sounds like I want it to. Right. And I started getting so many people that were just so happy. And, um, you know, really, that was honestly like probably more impactful for me as mm -hmm. a builder than ever trying to clone something and yeah. coming back and be like, oh, look, it sounds exactly like that Dumble. I don't care if it sounds like that Dumble. I care if my customer absolutely loves playing the amp. Yeah. yeah I remember I built a um, a copy of uh, Ford's pedal board and bought an original Zen drive and all this stuff, his travel board, right? And uh, and I, I, I got it and I put it together and I, I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds, I can sound exactly like Robin Ford until I play the second note. <laughs> and then you, and then you're right back to still not Robin Ford. Go practice your lessons. Um, I think that's great. Uh, somebody, I don't want to miss it. Somebody put in the questions. Let me go back here. Uh, Cappy says, any combos? I guess I'm showing all pictures of heads. You do combos for all the amps. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. It's just a selection on the website. Tracy, Tracy Farmer's got uh, a rare Dumble. And Tracy, that was originally purchased as a combo, 50 watt combo. And he's got it in a head and cab right now. I don't know why Tracy's got it set up different that way, but he did point out to me that it sounds very different set up as a head and a, and a, and a speaker cab. Would you say that's very true as, of most of your amps as well? Yeah. I mean, the combo adds the portability, right? Like ease of setup. You don't have to even worry about plugging your speaker cable in, right? It's smaller, more compact. Generally, yeah. it's less expensive. Um, the head and cabinet route is, you know, it sounds better. It does. You it sounds bigger, better. It's got its own enclosure. Yeah, totally. I mean, the combos are great. Like, and and I know guys like Joe Bonamassa, yeah. you know, swear by the combos. Um, what I usually hear is better headroom with it, like a head and one by twelve cabinet, mm -hmm. deeper bass, bigger sound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and if you think about it, like the speaker firing in that enclosure, um, sometimes can cut, put a little extra wear on the tubes. You know what I mean? Because they're like in the same box. Yeah. So we've done things like we've opened the boxes up a little bit, like the, you know, ported the back and stuff and put some vents in. So it doesn't build up too much sound pressure. Um, but I'm not, you know, I don't want just the combos. Like they're great too, you know? Yeah. Okay, cool. It's, uh, we got 10 minutes left. We got two more types of amps. So um, that's the ultraphonics and gain, right? That you guys do. Amphiphonics and gain. Yep. Which so is let's go to the trim drive first. Okay. Trim I don't have, really I don't have a clip of that. So you go ahead and talk about it. Trim drive just came out a few months ago. Yeah. It's our version of the Dumble Overdrive Deluxe. There is not a lot known about that amp. There is a, a wonderful clip um, on YouTube. It's been around for a while, but 1979 Overdrive Deluxe. It's got uh it's basically a deluxe reverb that was modded and um, has a ton more gain, but retains the trem and the reverb. So it's a single channel amp. It's got a bunch, it's, again, like a lot of volume controls, two gain controls and a master volume. Um, so you can get some really great kind of like Fender vintage sounds out of it, or you can get it uh, cranked up and it actually kind of goes into some uh, kind of Marshall territory. Hmm. So that amp was traditionally 22 watts. There's been some other builders that have come out with that as well and kind of kept it in that same um, power level. Yeah. Um, but I, I said, hey, you know, what? let's just like push it to all the other uh, customization options that we have. So we do that amp in 150 watts, same deal, head and two by 12 if you want. It's really fun to play. That's cool. That's very cool. And that's your most recent model. Yeah, that was came out in May. Okay. Uh, I, got a, I got a top chat here from my good friend, John Beato. Yes, if it sounds like he's related to somebody that we talk about, my good friend, Rick. Um, we just I got to spend a couple of days with uh, John and his wife there in New York for the show as well. Thanks, John, for that top chat. Uh, Keith Dooley's uh, in the top chat wants to say thanks for booking such a great guest. There you go. There you go. See, I guess you're doing okay. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, people are saying there's some ads interrupting the stream. That's that's YouTube, boys and girls. They keep changing the way they they manage that, so I can't really change that. Um, and then Patrick Aquiliana says, "Just thank you, appreciate it." So let's do the last one. Let's talk about uh, what, what is referred to as an ultraphonics. And I think that the biggest thing that I learned, really, the biggest thing I learned when doing the research, was that the ultraphonics, like everything else, is not a stock model as much as it was him people describing him gutting a standard amp, whether it was for Kenny Wayne Shepard or, um, or Dave Cobb, you know, where the couple of the examples that I used or, or Clapton, I think, you know, those bandmasters that he plays are kind of an ultraphonics. So what is that? So the ultraphonics is another one. There's just not a lot known about it. There's not a lot of them out there. Um, and they're all a little bit different. So th there's a couple different models. I can go into the details, uh, but essentially an ultraphonics is a modded fender amp. A modded uh, fender. Okay. There was a period of time when Dumble was, um, he basically would take a, an old fender, a black face or a silver face, and he would do two different things. So he would go in and basically mod the amp, um, or he would go in and drop a completely different circuit board on top of the fiber board. He, he would essentially pull the fender board out and put a PCB in and then rewire it. Hmm. The ultraphonics was well known as the best fender clean you've ever heard. So okay. it's got a, um, just a beautiful clean cha channel. It doesn't break up much, but when you get it to break up, it's amazing. So hmm. you do have to crank it a little bit. Not many of those amps had master volumes. So mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of stuff online. People are saying, oh, you know, the ultraphonics is great, but you got to turn it up to 10. Right. <laughs> you know? So, um, but yeah, there was, uh, so Dumble was working with a music store in California and people were dropping off their fenders and he would actually take them in batches. Um, so he'd take like five or six amps from the music store with a check for five grand. And he would go back and he would mod those amps and then bring them back to the music store and people would essentially have an ultraphonics. Huh. Um, he started making this amp called the ultraphonics and gain as well. Okay. Yeah. So there's, it's even lesser known about that one. There's, I don't know how many there are, but there's not that many. And uh, the ultraphonics and gain was a really unique one. And that's actually what the amplophonics and gain is inspired after. Um, I had a good friend of mine, his name is Scott White. I'm sure he won't mind I, if I use his name. Um, he's been a great friend for for many years now. He's a he's an actor in uh, in L.A. Big into the Dumble scene. Great guitar player, and he actually ordered an Ultraphonics directly from Dumble, and uh, he wanted it to be the Ultraphonics and gain, and have that great clean channel, but have the gain channel. So it actually had an overdrive channel, mm -hmm. um, and this one in particular was based off of Eddie Van Halen's Brown Sound, so kind of really Marshall plexi ish, a uh, lot of gain scooped real heavy. Um, and he sent me that amp back in 2017 wow. and I got to reverse engineer it. It was, it had been gooped and had been degooped. So when I got it, it was not gooped and we went through it, reverse engineered it. It was a great sounding amp. And again, kind of modernized it, like make, made our own version. So we added channel switching. So you could go with a foot switch from the ultraphonic side to the gain side. We added reverb, mm. which was great. And um, when we put it in a non fender enclosure, so it's, it's more in that same kind of like traditional uh, 19 inch chassis. Mm -hmm. And we came out with the ultraphonics, uh, the amplophonics and gain. So it's a really great amp. It does so many different tones. The amplophonics is the clean side. That's the ultraphonics channel. Yeah. And again, real crispy, very fender sounding, low plate amp, um, beautiful cleans, a lot of attitude if you crank it up, but it does need some volume. And then the gain channel is the um, Eddie Van Halen brown sound, but it does so many different tones. You can dial it back and turn the gain down and get like Hendrix, Almond Brother, Woman Tone, Clapton stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you increase the gain, get kind of more modern Marshall sounds, JCM 800. It'll do some Soldano stuff and it'll even do some like heavy metal tones. Hmm. So it, it's, it's an impressive amp. It's, 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 it's got a lot of gain and it's, it could be too much for some people. Yeah. Um, but the guys that get into that amp um, always love it. And then usually I get the call afterwards because people buy that amp for the gain channel and they were like, Taylor, this is the best clean I have ever heard. Hmm. Yeah. So that's it, been a, it's been a hot model for us lately. 
So it's interesting. We were talking earlier today and I misunderstood. So you're saying that a lot of these different flavors of gain are in the amp. I thought what you were saying was you could, you could uh, customize the gain side of the amp for people, depending on what they were looking for. You're saying a lot of it, a lot of these various tones are there depending on where you end up with the controls. I mean, it depends on the amp, right? That one in particular has a lot of flexibility okay. just, just with the, just dialing the, uh, the gain control around. Right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, have we, pl we played all of the clips. Oh, I never ran the, I have a clip of Robin Ford talking about the ODS. I think everybody's heard that story of Robin talking about how, when he ordered his second amp, Alexander Dummel told him that, um, it was, um, it was his, him watching him play with his brothers, uh, up in, um, Santa Cruz that, uh, it's inspired the ODS. Um, I'm trying to think, is there one, the problem when I pull these in, uh, guys, the, it takes the names off my files. So I'm looking at a pile of files here. I think we've got them all. The last thing I wanted to talk about, some, somebody asked, um, oh, somebody said that they played a Dumble and it was amazing. That's, that's to be expected. Uh, the thing I wanted to say, oh, Chris Butler says, Taylor, your amps sound killer, especially RJ's hands. Um, oh, he's mentioning the ads. So the last thing I wanted to talk about as we're kind of closing out the hour is um, I've, I've watched some other videos by some other YouTubers and they were kind of pointing out the prices. The channel here has a real theme of, you know, fewer and better. Um, you know, you need less gear. And one of the things I said in the video, because I'm finding it true with the amp that's here, is you can, or like what you just said with the Amplifonics and Gain, you can get a lot of different tones out of a single amp. And I think a lot of people think that they have to have a big amp collection. I'm going to just say, I don't even sell amps for a living, but I'm just going to say that I think we're all better off with less gear that we know really well. I loved your story about like using the, a Telecaster as your sort of workhorse to get a sense of what's actually happening in a different amp that you plug in because it's going to go out of the house and you knowing what it is. So your, your prices, we were talking earlier, your prices are actually sort of um, mid prices in a, in a Dumble world. There's Fuchs that are less. I, I don't know if there's other people. Well, Serotone amps are less. There's Bluetone, which is like three times as much. And I assume there's other people. You mentioned somebody else that I'd never heard of who, who's doing one-off, one person, one-off builds of Dumbles. So how did you decide uh, on pricing structure? And, and, um, and as since I just already made a big speech about how I think that, frankly, your pricing structure makes sense, I'll be quiet, but talk about how you going about doing that, how you do that. Well, all right. Our amps are hand built. We have extreme attention to detail. Uh, so, you know, that takes time. And we've really tried to put the best components that we can find into the amps, you know, high quality capacitors, high quality resistors, pots. Um, everything is made here in the U S I have the chassis here made in, in uh, Massachusetts. Like our boards are made here in New Jersey. Uh, cabinets are made in North Carolina. Like everything we do is, is, is us made. I want it to be competitive in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also want to know, I want people to feel like they're getting a quality product. You know, they're, they're, they're not getting a cheap amp. They're going to get an amp. That's going to last. They're going to get an amp that has ultra low noise floor. They're going to get an amp that they can dial in easy. They're going to get an amp that they can feel good about when they go out and play with their friends. And when they're trying to impress people at a bar, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it's gotta, it's gotta be something that is of value, you know? So, um, and, and, you know, I gotta be honest, like we, we have, um, I got a team of people here now. We got, we got a commercial space, you know, we've got marketing and stuff like that. Like I, I got guys online that are like, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're expensive amps. And it's like, yeah, they are expensive, but I want to be the best that there is. You know, mm -hmm. we really want to, and, and you got to pay for that, mm -hmm. you know? So, um. You know, it definitely has been something we've struggled with. Like, you know, some guys do, you know, they'll be like, ah, oh, it's just too expensive. But for the most part, it's, it's not an issue with most of our customers. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked who makes potentiometers in the U S. Um, well, we get them. From, I didn't say that they were from the U S but <laughs> we, we buy them from somebody in the U S. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. I didn't say the pots were made here. <laughs> right. I don't think there's anybody doing it. Well, even, even guys like my friend Sebastian at, um, vintage inspired pots, that's a company that's based right near you. Actually, he's, he's right out there in Boston, in the Boston area, but he told me this, I'm going to have him on at some point. Um, he, he had a fall and he couldn't be on, but the fact is, uh, he went through the whole story about how he ended up having those specific pots built at a company in Japan. And he went there and visited with them and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, like, specking parts is a huge part of your job. We were talking earlier and I said, we could easily do an hour on the 
non-AMP specific parts of what it is to have a relationship with customers. And I don't want to leave here without, you already talked about it a bunch, but um, the, the fact that you're doing phone calls with, with customers all the time, it's not somebody else on the team. This is you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still doing all the sales <laughs> myself. So yeah, I talk to a lot of people, um, you know, but I enjoy the process. We try to make sure that we, you know, we, we find the right amp for the, for the, for the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I, I've got a series of questions. I usually ask people, find out what they're playing now, you know, what style of guitars they're playing, what are the playing situations that they're in? Are they using the amp home studio? Are they gigging with it? You know, what, what are their style of music? Like there's, there's a list that I have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, cause we want to make sure that people, people are happy and right. we have seven amps in the lineup. They all do something a little bit different. Some have overlap, some don't. Um, but not every single amp is right for every single customer, you know? So, uh, yeah, we, we've, uh, you know, we definitely try to make sure that we, we get the right amp with the right person. That's great. That's great. I think that's very much in spirit of the lineage as well. I think that's something that I, as I understand it, everything I've read was that that was that and the connection that you talked about before that when somebody plugs in and they play one of your amps, there's kind of this moment of. Uh, there's a connection between the instrument and what's coming out into the room that they hadn't experienced before. Yeah. Yeah, yep, definitely. That's... All right. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for being here. I apologize if there were things that we didn't get to. Um, I think we got through the stuff Taylor and I thought we were going to talk about today. Um, I'm really liking it. Uh, I think people had a fun time and everybody likes to nerd out. Otherwise they wouldn't be here at five watt world. Um, and, uh, maybe we'll have you back sometime. I'm having a great time learning all about dumbbells with the amp that's in the living room and uh, folks that follow me on Instagram have seen that already. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, today was brought to you by the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. There's a link in the description, so go ahead and use that. I want to thank Vebe for moderating today. And uh, once again, thanks, Taylor, for being here. All right. Thank you very much, Keith. Good time. Right. Good time. All right. And I'm going to have RJ play us out. Uh, since it's your favorite, I'm going to use the bombshell clip. Where is that? Where's the bombshell clip? Okay, I can't find it. There it is. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll see everybody next time. And thanks for being a part of five watt world. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.